Hey everyone, welcome to the Foundry Church. My name is Jeff Vandermolen and I'm the ministry director and online venue pastor here at the Foundry. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. If you have not done so already, I just encourage you to take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat bar. I'd love to know who's joining us for our worship service. Also, if this is your first time worshiping with us, I encourage you to text the keyword Foundry Online to 94000, and that'll be a way for you to get updates and stay connected. Just know what's going on here at the Foundry Church. A couple announcements to share with you. First, our devotionals. Um, These devotionals were put together by our amazing team of writers and are available to you for free. Here at the Foundry Church, we believe in transformation. We believe that we're transformed into God's image and we don't transform him into ours. So it's important to be in the Word of God. These devotionals include the whole book of Proverbs and you can pick them up anytime by the west doors in the airlock. Um, You can go online, foundrychurch.net, scroll down, and you'll find an electronic copy there. Or if you live outside of West Michigan and you'd like me to ship you a copy, send me an email at online at foundrychurch.net. I'll make sure you get one. I want to say thank you for your generosity with your offerings and God's tithes. If you'd like to give to the Foundry Church, you can do so by going to our homepage, foundrychurch.net, clicking on the Give tab and following the instructions there. Or if you'd rather send your offering to the church, you can mail it. Our church address is up on the screen right now. I also just want to make you aware that at 11.15 today, we're going to continue with our online shakeout lessons. So kids, I just encourage you to come back at 11.15 um, to, be in, to learn more about God and uh, just to grow in your relationship with him. So 11.15 today, shortly after our online service. And some exciting news to share with you this morning. Alex and Marcy Koch welcomed their baby daughter, Harper Leanne Koch, into their family on February 18. We praise the Lord that both baby and mom are doing well. Um, So if you know the Koch family, we just encourage you to reach out to them, congratulate them, and we are so excited, excited to welcome this newest member into the Foundry community. That's all the announcements I have for us this morning, so let's open with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you that we get to gather, that we get to worship you, that we get to learn more about you this morning. And God, I praise you for the healthy birth of Harper, Leanne Koch, to Alex and Marcy. Um, Lord, I just pray that you give Alex and Marcy wisdom as they raise her. And I pray that Harper, that she'd be surrounded with friends that will encourage her and her faith and that will point her to you, Um, God. And Lord, I thank you um, again for this chance to worship. I pray that you please be with Matt today as he shares the message. I pray that the words that he speaks, that they would be words that come from you, and not of his own, Father. Um, Lord, we just want to surrender this time and this space to you. Open our hearts this morning to whatever it is that you want us to, to hear from you today. God, we love you. Um, I thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Today we're talking about trust. Uh, In this life, we don't always understand what's going on or why we're waiting or what's going to happen next. But the one thing we do know is the character of the God we trust and serve. We can trust in him alone. As we begin to worship him, we just lay everything else down before him. Let go of your worries, your control, and just tell him that you trust him. So let's worship together.
trust him. So let's continue singing out what we believe in God. you. Your ways are so much higher than our own. We know this to be true, Lord, so increase our faith when we're weak and teach us today through your word. Speak through Matt and transform us by your Holy Spirit. Amen.
Hey everybody, my name is Matt Kuman, and I'm the group's pastor here at the Foundry. I'm so excited for today because we are continuing in, uh, we had just started a new series. We've been working through the book of Proverbs so far this year, and we started with a series on the characteristics of God and some of the characteristics that we should have in our relationship. And you may have seen this image of putting things in our backpack for the journey ahead. And we just wrapped up wrapped up that series and we just moved into a new series on relationship to God. And this is the idea that there's some specific things and characteristics that we should have in our lives in our relationship to God. So Eric started out that series last week with this idea of fear and how do we fear God. Now that, that kind of sounds funny but when I think about it and the image that comes to my head is when I was a young boy looking up to my dad. Right In my eyes, he was the most powerful man out there. He could do anything. He was invincible in my eyes. And it was, I, I was in fear of him in a way, but I was never afraid of him. Right? There's a difference between fear and afraid. And I think we need to have that image of God. He is all-knowing and he is all-powerful. Um, and fear doesn't mean afraid, but yet that's one thing that we can have in our relationship to God. We can feel safe in his guidance because of some of those fears. So, uh, fear is how we started out this series. Uh, we're on week two of that series and we're going to be talking about trust. And fear and trust are very different things because trust, we all know, is something that can be easily broken, right? If something happens in a relationship, uh, trust can be broken. And even one step farther than that, if trust is broken, sometimes it's so hard to gain that trust back. There's a lot of levels to trust, and we're going to be talking about some of those things today. Um, and I want to start off with a story of about five or six years ago of trust in material items. I, a, lot, a lot of my buddies like to snowmobile um, during the winter. So what I did is a few years ago I bought this big red old snowmobile. Um, it was a pretty slow thing but I loved it and I enjoyed hanging out with the guys this way. So I bought the snowmobile and one weekend we went up north and we're driving around on the trails and just screwing around and we come up to this giant lake. And all the guys, most of my buddies had like new sleds, really fast sleds. And they're like, let's race across the lake to see who's the fastest. I'm like, sweet. I've got the oldest and slowest sled. I know this isn't going to go in my favor. So we get up to the line where we're all going to start. And someone says, go. And we just all take off. And I hung with them for like 1.2 seconds. And then they were gone. And I was just in their dust. Uh, but I was like, okay, I'll just, I'll make it to the end. And we'll laugh about how slow my sled is. And as I'm driving, as I'm following them, I'm looking at their paths next to me where their snowmobiles have gone past and I see water like splashing water there's supposed to be frozen ice underneath there but there's water and I look and I'm starting to slow down a little bit and I look behind me and if you've ever seen the image of like a sea dew in the water when it's spitting up like a tail of water that's what was coming behind my snowmobile and if you know anything about snowmobiles, that's not supposed to happen. You're not supposed to see water shooting up behind you when you're on a snowmobile. Um, and to make a long story short, I did survive from that lake, even though the lake tried to eat me. But I made it out. And from that point on, after I made it off of that lake, I made a vow that I would never trust frozen lakes again. <laughs> from that point, I have not been on a frozen lake with my snowmobile since that point. It's just not worth it. I'm not even allowing that trust to be remade again. I, I just don't want anything to do with it. Right? We have these sometimes funny ideas of where trust has been broken. So I think to the Lions, every year I have trust that they're going to make it to the Super Bowl. And every year that trust is broken. Uh, we have that with vehicles, right? Think about uh, vehicles that you invest money into and think this is going to be the vehicle that makes it for a while. And there's repairs and there's things that happen. Um, but those are all materialistic. There's, there's things in our lives where trust can be broken in relationships. And 
then, then it gets a lot more personal and it gets hard. And today we're going to be talking about some of those issues revolving around trust, um, especially with our relationship with God. More than just the materialistic or personal trust issues, we're going to be talking about our relationship to God in that trust. Um, but what happens when we lose trust? Right? For, for me, on the ice, on the snowmobile, I decided never again will I be on the ice. But if it's, if it's a bigger issue than that, um, sometimes we pace when we lose trust, right? Because we're angry and we're trying to figure out the problem. Um, trust becomes an issue when we lose control. We pace. If you're anything like me, I pace when I lose control because I want to figure out a solution to these things. We get angry. We get frustrated. We dwell on things because we can't fix them. You see, this is what we feel when we lose control of something. And I love the words of Proverbs 3, verse 5. You've read them this week in devotions if you have those. If you don't, if you don't have devotions, uh, let us know. We'd love to get you a copy. Just reach out to us. But Proverbs 3, verse 5 says this, and I love how it speaks into this trust. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not onto your own understanding. Trust, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not onto your own understanding. Um, and we're going to be talking about in a bit what that understanding looks like. But I want to first go into a story about Jesus. Because I think in Matthew 6 that we're going to be going into, Jesus actually probably has these verses in the back of his mind when he's teaching uh, to this crowd. And what we find in Matthew 6 that we're just about to get into, I want to give you a little bit of context around the story um, Matthew 6, it's the first gospel in the New Testament. Um, and in the beginning of the gospel, Jesus is born, right? Very beginning of the gospel, Jesus is born. Um, and he, last week we talked about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness and being tested by Satan. And this is that chapter right before it. So Jesus is born, um, and he, just before he starts his ministry, goes out into the wilderness. That's what Eric just spoke on with fear of God last week. And after he comes out of the wilderness, what we find is that he starts to raise up disciples, and he starts to call disciples. And after he calls a few disciples, he actually goes around and he starts to heal people. Um, he heals people of diseases, and he cures the sick, and because of those things, crowds start to gather around him because they want to see who is this Jesus and why, why is he able to do all of these things. So crowds start to gather around him. And what we find in Matthew 6, it's actually the, the Sermon on the Mount is the chapter of Matthew 6. And it's where Jesus goes up on this mountainside with the crowd and his disciples around him. And I love Jesus' posture in this because if it were me and crowds were starting to gather out, I'd start getting anxious. I would start pacing like, okay, what do these people need to hear? What do they need to know? And the posture we see Jesus in is actually very calm. Um, what we find is that Jesus sits down and the crowds gather around him and the disciples are around him and he begins to teach and he says these words. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Right? Picture this scene with me. Everyone's sitting up on this mountainside, looking up or looking down towards Jesus. Everyone's gathered around and he says that. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. You can just picture this. They're outside on the mountains. You can imagine birds flying by and Jesus saying, Look, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap, which is uh, plant or harvest. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet, their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than those birds? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? I love picturing Jesus' posture in this. He's not pacing back and forth saying, guys, you need to listen to this. You need to listen not to worry about things. Jesus sits. And he gives them the posture that they should have when they're worrying about things. Don't worry about it. Uh, verse 28 continues. 
And why do you worry about clothes? I wonder if Jesus heard an argument the day before or a concern on that day like, oh, what am I going to wear to this thing? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. Again, I'm sure he points to the side. Look, guys, look at the flowers around you. See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon. And Solomon is, is this very wealthy man. If Jesus said the word Solomon, they would have, think, they would have thought the highest man possible who is so wealthy. Uh, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these flowers. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Ah, oh, don't you love those words of Jesus and the posture that Jesus had just sitting down and explaining to the people, you guys don't have to worry about what's going on because God is in control. Right, we think and we talk a lot about context here at the Foundry of what the people may have been going through that they were wrestling with, that they were worrying about. And we, we place them in their context. But what I love most is that those words of Jesus that were spoken over 2,000 years ago relate so much to today. Right, those words I need to hear repeating in my life over and over again and being reminded that, okay, who Who's in control? We can see flowers out in the field. We see birds in the air. Shouldn't that be our reminder that, you know, they're, they're doing great. God takes care of them. Why would he not any less take care of me? But let's be real for a minute. Um, because we talked about in the beginning of this that trust uh, doesn't necessarily come naturally unless things are going really good. Right? Why, why is it easy to trust when things are going good? Because if we're honest, if things are going good, we feel like we're in control of things. Think to your workplace or your job. If you get a promotion, you may not think, oh, God got me this promotion, or you didn't trust that God got you there. Because you can think, I, I arrive on time, or I arrive early, and I work late, and I have been working hard, and I deserve this promotion. I got this promotion. See, when things are going good, we... Trust isn't an issue. Like, yeah, that's great. Awesome. We can keep moving on with our lives. But trust is way harder when times are different. When our life isn't going nearly as planned because we need to rely on somebody else at that point. Right? When our life isn't going as planned, we look to outside sources to help fix those problems because things didn't go like we thought it would. See, this became... Um, actually, a very real thing for me and my wife a few years ago. And five or six years ago, we met a couple from church and went out to dinner with them. And we're getting to know them. And they kind of asked about our life story, how we met, all that type of stuff. And we continued into, like, this is our life's journey. This is what our life is going to be. Uh, me and Jalen, I don't know if we were even quite married then yet, uh, but we were explaining that we were going to get married, um, we were going to buy this special house, and we were going to have this great youth ministry. And then after that, we were going to start a family. Um, I was going to tell them when I was going to retire and what retire retirement was going to look like, trust me, I laid out my whole life to these new people I had just met, like I have got my life planned out. I was a naive like 20, 21 year old and I had my life planned out. We, we had our life journey mapped in the way we thought it was going to go. And then things changed a little bit. So you see, so when it was time um, to start having kids, uh, things didn't actually go like we had planned. See, month after month, uh, we found out that 
Jalen wasn't pregnant. Um, some of you know what that journey is like. Some of you husbands know what watching your wife go through that looks like. Some of you wives know what it feels like to not be pregnant month after month. And at first, to be honest with you, we trusted in God's timing. We trusted God because we knew the right things to say to ourselves. That God's got a plan. He's got it all worked out. He, it's in his perfect timing. Um, we're just maybe a little bit early in his timing. Okay, we'll, we'll give it some time. But then as those months turned into more months and the months turned into years, those questions didn't get answered as easily anymore. Um, that trust that we had in God wasn't as firm as it was in the beginning. And those doubts raised some question in both me and my, wife, my wife's lives as we thought, is God listening? Is, is he really there? Does, does he care about us? Is, did, did God forget about us? Is, is he not hearing what we're trying to say? And even to the extent of, it, is he punishing us for something? Why? Why is this not going as we had planned? Um, and we, we tried to stay positive. We, we really did. We, we stayed positive month after month. Um, but as those months turned into years, Jalen and I, uh, we had always prayed together about having a family and raising a family together. And we figured out that those prayers kind of, to be honest with you, I, I stopped praying about a family for a while. Because I felt like God wasn't answering or wasn't listening to us. Um, it got harder to talk, talk to God about it because it felt like he wasn't listening. We were hurt. And to be truthfully honest, we were just heartbroken. And up until this point, um, Jalen and I had kept that journey of infertility to ourselves. We hadn't talked to anybody about it. You, you always hear the things of, oh, when are you going to start a family? Oh, trying to finish a few things up on the house first. You, you have all these excuses, but those questions start ringing in your ears. Um, and after a couple years of this journey, we realized that this, this wasn't something that we were going to be able to do on our own. What we were doing wasn't working, and one of the first steps we did is we asked a few select people to start praying for us um, because we weren't able to do it on our own. We couldn't control the outcome anymore. I um, mean, honestly, I think that prayer, that those prayers uh, changed our attitude about life um, because our posture changed I think directly from those prayers and we started to realize and we noticed that even when we found out that Jalen wasn't pregnant another month that we trusted God more, that we trusted in his outcome um, and we trusted that God may have a different plan for us that maybe it wasn't having kids on our own. We started looking into, we booked a, um, an appointment with an infertility clinic, um, and we started looking through options there. Uh, we started looking through adoption, maybe, or foster care. Or we even thought, okay, maybe we're not supposed to have kids. I was a youth pastor at the time, and maybe our kids, well, we are just supposed to love on the youth in our church. Maybe that is what our path and our journey was supposed to be. Um, we started to be able to pray about it again. Um, that's, and that was a good moment for us as a couple because we almost were able to reconnect and pray and understand that God still had a plan for, his, for our lives. It may not look the way we thought it was going to look, but God still had a plan for our lives, and we realized that he knew the bigger picture, even if we didn't fully understand that picture. And then um, what's crazy is that shortly after that newfound peace, uh, Jalen found out she was pregnant. Um, and I still remember this moment um, we were sitting, at, we were building a house, and I remember sitting in the house, it was my birthday, and Jalen surprised me on my birthday with a onesie that said, I'm so excited to meet you, Dad, or something to that extent. And I remember that moment like it was yesterday. And we were so excited. We were elated to finally 
feel like we were back on this path that we had designed. Um, and we, we were just so excited. We, and we started making plans, right? We're going to have a family. And this Christmas, we'll, we'll be able to have our first Christmas with her. And all of these different things started going into our minds. It was amazing how quickly we fell in love with this child that we hadn't even met yet. Um, and our, we went to the first appointment at it was actually at the infertility center yet, and they did an ultrasound. Um, and Jalen was told at that ultrasound that there's a 80 to 90 percent chance that this pregnancy is going to result in miscarriage. And in that initial moment, we were we were struck. Uh, we didn't really know where to turn. Uh, initially, we had questions, asking God why. Like, why would you have us walk down this journey and get our hopes up so much to just walk us down this path? You see, we're heartbroken in a matter of minutes, and we just knew um, that the doctor actually told us, because we asked him, is there anything we can do? Like, can we have her eat some special stuff? Is it like bed rest? What, what can we do to make this pregnancy more viable that it's going to work? He said, nothing. This, this is really out of your control. What you need to understand is that you have the next two weeks, and if there's a heartbeat in two weeks, then this pregnancy will probably last. But if there isn't, then it's not going to be like you're hoping it to be. And what we realized really quickly that, again, things were very much out of our control. And those two weeks were the hardest two weeks of my life, but yet it brought me to a spot of realizing that trust doesn't come easily, right? And trusting God in those hard points, um, those most difficult points in life are where you grow the most. Um, And over those two weeks, me and Jalen had a lot of conversations and had to remind each other that God still had the bigger picture. That didn't mean life was any easier for us those two weeks, but we had that hope that God still had that bigger picture in mind. And I remember driving up to the appointment that day for the ultrasound, and that car ride to Grand Rapids from Hudsonville was quiet because we knew what we were about to face. Um, We didn't know what the answer was going to be, but as we sat, after we parked at the appointment, appointment at the doctor's office we sat there looking at the doors and we had a sense of peace because before we walked in we we told each other even if it's a no even if if this doesn't work God still has this figured out right God still is in control of our story and I can't explain to you the sense of peace that came over our lives as we walked in. Um, And what's exciting about our story is that we got to hear, oh, we got to hear the heartbeat that day. And next week, uh, we actually get to baptize McKenna. And our life has changed so much because of what she has been in our life. But that doesn't change the fact that we, we trusted God when it mattered most. And we still to this day have conversations that even if that didn't work out like we thought, we still knew that God was in control of our story and that God had the bigger picture in mind. See, what I don't want you to hear out of my story um, is that God is like a genie in a bottle, right? If you trust him hard enough, if you say the right things, your life is going to work out like you want it to. Uh, Because I have really good friends who have walked a similar journey that we have and year after year still are not able to start a family and they trust God. I also have friends who have walked their parents through diagnosis and 
they trust God and they walked a journey that they did not want to. You see, God is not like a genie. The book of Proverbs that we've talked about is not a group of, uh, of verses that's a self-help, that if you do these things, this will be a result of it. Trusting in the Lord and leaning not onto your own understanding is not going to all of a sudden help you with your plans in life. You see, trusting in God is not easy, but what it is, is it, it, it may not always allow us to do what we want, but God, it will allow us to see that God has a bigger purpose in our life. You see, we might, may not be able to fully understand it now, or in a week, or in a year. We may not see why that bigger purpose has to happen. We may not even be able to see it in our lifetime, but what we do know is that in our life, when we let go and allow God to trust, and we, we allow ourselves to trust God, is when there can be a sense of peace that we may have never experienced before. See, how does this relate to your life? See, I think of the story of our life with infertility and miscarriage, or the thought of miscarriage and the thought of starting a family. Maybe you're having a hard time trusting God in those moments. Maybe your story is really close to our story. See, maybe um, you pace with worry about your finances because you don't know where the next paycheck's coming from. Or maybe you just don't know what finances are gonna look like and you're stressed about having a full retirement package and, and full things in the garage and you realize, okay, am I trusting God in these moments? Or maybe you're struggling with trusting God because a family member was diagnosed with cancer or another disease and you question why God won't just heal them. Because we know God has that power. See, I don't know what area in your life you need to kind of take a step back and say, how can I allow God how can I trust God in a different way than I ever have before? You see, it's not fully about trusting his plan. It's not about fully trusting that God's going to work through our plan in our life. Right? If we trust God, the things that we have planned out for our lives may not fully happen. See, God has a plan for each and every one of us, and that may not be the plan that we have. But what I know is that our purpose here on, on earth is to raise disciples, to bring other people to Christ, to show the love of Jesus to everyone around us. And our paths to do that thing are very different than the people around us. Our journey, me and Jalen's journey, is very different than, the, than all of you. Wherever you may be, our situation is very different than yours. But... If we trust God and the things we want in our past to make our own lives better don't actually matter. If we fully trust God, we trust him in realizing that the path in our life may not be what we thought it was going to be. But if we realize and we trust him that, okay, the path you have set for us, whether that be having kids whether it be walking through a diagnosis, whether that be struggling through job loss, that path that he has for you may open some doors that you never thought were possible. See, many of your dreams may not come true because the path God has for you is one intention of bringing people to Christ. You see, when me and Jalen realized that it gave us a sense of peace. And if you see yourself pacing with worry about big things or little things, I strongly encourage you to look at how you're trusting God. Because I think we all, we all or many of us, trust in God some. But do we trust him enough to let go of the worries and stop pacing and thinking about the concerns of our life? See, I want you to hear loud and clear that I'm not teaching you today how to trust God so that you can get what you want out of life. Um, we need to trust God that he has a bigger plan in our life and continue to follow his path for our life. 
I love in the end of Jesus' ministry, um, he, he knows that he is about to be uh, turned over to the authorities. It's, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane with, with the disciples. The disciples are off praying, and he's having this conversation with God, his heavenly Father. And he asks God, God, if you can, take this cup from me. And what we know is that Jesus understands what is about to come. He knows that he is going to be tortured, that he is going to be hung on the cross for the sins of everybody, and he pleads with God, if you can, take this cup, me, cup from me. But he ends with it saying, but not my will, but yours be done. See, I love that story of Jesus. Because what we realize is that in our lives, in Jesus' life, there's things that are so hard that we go through that we don't want to go through. And we want to find a simple way out or a reason that we're going through these. And even Jesus' response shows the humanity in who Jesus was saying, if you can take this from me, please do it. But he ends it with, but if not, but if, you, if, if not my will, your will be done. It's having the posture of stepping back from our posture of pacing back and forth in all of this worry to almost sitting down like I picture Jesus doing, not only for, for the, the, the teaching he did on the mountain, but also in the Garden of Gethsemane where he sits back and says, not my will, but yours be done. I sit down because you're the one in control. You have the path planned out for me. We may not understand why. We may not understand why we may be struggling with some things or going through things that we don't understand where God is working in it, but maybe one day we will. See, I look back at our life now, and there's a reason McKenna was born when she was. See, God worked through our journey and through our path, and he knew the path that was designed for us, even if we couldn't see it. So I want to leave you with one last question, and it's a question that uh, I've wrestled with for years and need to constantly remind myself of these things. It's this question, how do I know when I trust God fully? Because I think many of us in this room trust God. Right, We trust God when things are going good. We've talked about that. But how do we know when we trust God fully? And I want to give you a few points in this. Um, we trust God when we fully surrender our plans and our purposes for him. When we let go of the plans that we have for our life and the purposes that we want to get, our, get out of our lives, we fully commit into trusting God. Because we need to trust that God designed the path ahead of us. Think back to Proverbs verse three, chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And the second part is the best. Lean not onto your own understanding. We won't understand the path God has for us all the time. And that's okay because he's in control of it. Sometimes what we want or what we think we need, God does not give us because he has a bigger plan for us. And we may not be able to understand that plan because other people's path looks different than ours. We may not be able to understand of it or make any of that make sense, but trust God that he designed the path. See, God has a plan for each and every one of us. And those plans look different. But regardless, our job is to use the path that we're on to bring disciples to Christ. To allow others to see the love of Christ through us. And to point people, not to our actions, but to glorify God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not onto your own understanding. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the story uh, from Proverbs and through Jesus in many instances on what it looks like to trust you. 
we realize that we can so easily make plans in our life, for our life, for years to come, and we've got it all mapped out. But at the end of the day, if we're not looking to you for our path and our life that you have planned for us, we're, we're completely missing the point. See, God, I ask that as we look at how much we're trusting you in our lives, that we're able to take a step back and realize that our path may look different um, and that we, we look to you to design our path, that we have comfort and knowledge and peace that the path you have designed for us is, is the way. Um, we know you are the creator of all things and we ask that as we think about our lives that we, we have that peace that you are in control of it all and that we trust in the path that you have for us. In your name we pray, amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on the cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone oh praise the
love some of the words from Henry Blackaby um, that speaks on this idea of how often do we, when we're praying and when we're having conversations with God, ask God to come into our story. Right? I so often in my life think, God, come into this part of my story. This is how I'd like you to work in these parameters. Show up in this way. And I give them a box to show up into. And I love how Henry Blackaby kind of flips it on its head and says, what if we ask God for us to show up in his story? What if we changed that language and said, God, I trust you enough with my life that I'm going to let you do and work through my life in the way you need it to go. I know that you have the path designed for my life and I'm going to allow you to speak into those things. Man, there is a sense of peace that can come from that. We don't need to pace with worry anymore. We don't need to pace with concern about what is happening in our life when we have that peace that God is in control and that we can trust in who God is and his authority. Go with that knowledge and that peace today and go with this final blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, church. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us for our worship service today. I hope that the words that were spoken will encourage and challenge you to grow in your walk with the Lord. If you have a prayer request or you'd like for somebody to pray with you, you can text the keyword Foundry Online to 94000 and press the number three key. Somebody from our prayer team will get back with you shortly. That's all the announcements I have for you today. I um, just want to wish you a happy February 28th, last day of February. Winter's still here, but spring's not far away. So have a great week, everyone. We hope to have you join us again next week.